through some uh, slides, and hopefully as we work through these slides, you can follow the train of thought. And if not, then you can chat to me afterwards and see what this uh, was in my train of thought. So the question is just to answer is incredible, and this is just one, as I'm sure you know, of a series of four of these lectures that will take place in this room each evening this week through the first day at the same time of 7 30. So you're very welcome, it's good to see you, and um, it's a culture day to come back and another week as well. Okay, that's the preamble over. Christianity is incredible. Now, when we're thinking about this, let me just rephrase this, and I suppose you would assume this anyway, that speaking in a building like this, I'm speaking from a Christian perspective. That's my perspective as a Christian, and that's how I'm speaking on this subject. Now, however, having said that, many people who are not Christians do not take the view that Christianity is credible at all. In fact, many people take the view that it lacks credibility, and lacks credibility for various reasons. Now, that's not a new idea. You can read all sorts of philosophers and so on, and religious commentators, right back through, and some of them are there, some of the names might be familiar, you can see them from the back, and some might not be familiar to you, but for example, some of the, the philosophers would say, Marx being one of the more, I suppose, populist quote, spoke about religion, and God as being an opium of the people, and then Freud, an illusion of those who have remained childish, or Russell said, a placebo for fear, and of course, a very populist uh, atheist commentator in the round today, Dawkins, who speaks about it as illusion, and that is one of the titles of his books, we call it illusion. So it may well be that some of that resonates with yourself. And what I want to do is come at this from a different aspect. Rather than just put labels and tags on things, let's try to dig into this a bit and see what we're speaking about when I talk about Christianity. First question, what is it? Let's define our terms. Well, if you were to get a snapshot of what Christianity is, one of the most famous verses in the Bible that is known by people who are Christians and maybe some who are not is John chapter 3 and verse 16, and that's it there. And if you wanted a summary, a very succinct summary of Christianity, you would find it in this particular Bible verse. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that verse and many other Bible verses speak about Christianity in these terms. So it speaks about God, it speaks about his Son there, whose name is Jesus, and it speaks about our reaction to or response to God and his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's the heart of Christianity. Christianity, we're going to see, is not about buildings like this. It's not about format. It's not about creeds. It is actually about relationship. And it's about relationship with God through his Son, Jesus Christ. And that relationship is established Crucially, in terms of Christianity, in this principle that's expressed here, that whoever believes, the Bible uses the word faith. And faith is an important word in Christianity. Faith is perhaps a word that's used by all religions, a very important word in Christianity. So that then, whoever believes in him, in Christ, in Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life. And this verse teaches us that Christianity is of great importance because it deals with the issues which are not just for here and now, but for eternity. Now, Mark Twain, he said this, faith, as faith, is believing what you know ain't so. And he took the view that faith was a rubbish. That faith is to believe something when there's no factual basis. So it's like a kind of speculative trust. There is no real cause for it. And in fact, he would say, put it in those terms very quickly. Faith is believing what you actually know is not fact or being factually established. So you just have faith. You have faith. You know, I remember doing exams and I used to have faith. 
and taking the term broken brains, talking about, or in terms of that spec, was the focus somehow, somehow, something was going to happen, it wasn't based on any evidence, and something didn't happen. But faith in the Bible is not like that. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 defines faith. Not really much way to find it. But it speaks about faith as being evidence based. It's evidential. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's about things that are not seen. In fact, one commentator puts it this way about that verse it indicates a confident expectation. The kind of confidence we have when we have a good reason to believe something. That's faith. So in terms of Christianity, and what the Bible says about Christianity, it is a relationship established with God through Jesus Christ, and that relationship is established by faith, trusting, believing, because there is good reason to believe. Now you can test what the reason is, but that's how the Bible presents faith. And in the Bible, God gives us the reasons to believe. And we're going to look at some of them this evening. Now, Dawkins, um, he says that there are three bad reasons for believing in anything. And I agree with him. I've read some of his stuff, I don't agree with him. What he says, I agree with this. And when you apply this to Christianity, it's a valid application. So, three bad reasons for believing. Number one, tradition. That will not do. Can you come right home? There we go. Right there. Three bad reasons for believing. Number one, tradition. Beliefs that have no connection with evidence. So Dawkins says it's simply not good enough. It lacks credibility to, to believe something that's going to affect you in life and for eternity just because it's a tradition that has no evidential basis. Why well, I agree with you. That would be insufficient. That would lack credibility. I certainly would not be basing my life choices and my life path and my eternal hope upon tradition. I think less people today would now than about half generation past. Secondly, authority. To believe something just because you're told to believe it. Well, you know, that'd be three kids and they're adults. Well, two are adults, one thinks they're an adult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could tell them something is true and just say, just believe it because I'm telling you to believe it. Well, that just does not wash. Um, no, they did, no, they never did. But I agree with Dawkins. It's just not good enough. Just to accept it because someone tells you, you have to accept it. Thirdly, revelation. And Dawkins criticizes religion by saying, that religious people say they get a feeling inside themselves that something must be true and therefore they believe. I agree, that is wholly lacking in credibility. That is subjective. That is not evidence based. That's not objective. Because one day you might feel something, another day you might feel something else, and it's subject to your subjective analysis of what that is and how you feel and what that actually means. I certainly wouldn't be happy basing any decision to the eternity on how I feel. Because that changes from day to day, from hour to hour. Well, if there are three bad reasons for believing, when you come to the Bible, the Bible says there is one excellent reason for believing. And it's this. So then faith, belief in God and in Christ, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the Bible directs us not internally to our subjective feelings, not historically to tradition, not to some authority round about us which is man-based and man-made, but actually to a book. And the book is the Bible. And that's no surprise when we're speaking about Christianity. But Christianity speaks of and comes from the Bible as being the Word of God. And the Bible here, the Word of God, is given as the basis for a Christian's faith, the basis for my faith. I believe what the Bible says. I believe 
Bible says of me, I believe what the Bible says of God, I believe what the Bible says about everything around about me, I believe what the Bible says about morality, about hope, about religion, about all of these things. That's where my faith is founded. Now, I may feel differently about lots of things at different times, but the Bible doesn't change. The Bible is the word immutable. It's unchanging. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible, these are some stops in the Bible. Okay, this is just to give you a snapshot of what the Bible is. You may be unfamiliar with it. You may never have an opportunity or the desire to open one and read it, or you may have read it and decided not to read particularly deeply into it. Well, if that be the case, then listen. The Bible, these verses describe it, inspired and edited and followed, and let's get a kind of sense of what the book actually is. It is a unique book, genuinely unique. There is no other book on earth like it. Well, that's a big claim, so let's see if we can find out something about it. Well, first of all, who wrote the Bible? The answer to that is that over 40 different people wrote the Bible. And these 40 different people came from different backgrounds and occupations. They weren't all from the same social setting, they didn't have all the same education standards, they didn't do the same occupations, they came from different areas and they were king shippers, military leaders, fishermen, that's why the doctor, the junk folk, the road folk, there was a variety of people, 40 in total, who wrote the Bible. But, although there were 40 people who wrote the Bible, the Bible says that there was one source of information, one author, and God was that author. The Bible says that the, the Bible itself is inspired of God, it's God breathed, God spoke it out, and men wrote as God inspired them by 40 different people. Well, if you get 40 people, I don't know how many people are here, if you get 40 people in this room, and I was attempting to get you to collaborate, you're all from different backgrounds and occupations, to collaborate to produce one book, 40 people in one room, that would be a challenge. But actually, the Bible wasn't written like that. The Bible wasn't written in a year, or 10 years, or 100 years. It was written over a period of 1,600 years. Huge length of time. So 40 different people, not just from different occupations and backgrounds, but from different periods of history, all wrote the Bible. Also, when you think about the Bible, it's one book. It comprises of 66 books. It's like a library compendium, and it has a wonderful unity of message that runs through the whole thing. It's all interconnected. Well, where was it written? Well, it was written from places as far apart as Rome to Babylon, but not some places in between. Not even in the same continent, never mind the same language. It was written in palaces and prison cells and cities and barren islands. And when you think, and that's the structure of the Bible, which perhaps you won't see, and that the structure of the Bible is this, there wasn't even one form of writing. When you read the Bible, you discover this there is law, God's law, God's expression of his righteous standards for all humanity. You have history, namely the history of Israel, but not exclusively so. You have poetry books, you get prophetic books, and so on. You get the New Testament, you get the history and story of Jesus, the growth of the Christian church, you get instruction for the church, you get, you get prophecy relating to the future. But there's a wide variety of literature. 40 different people over 1600 years from Rome to Babylon, uh, and they didn't even write the same language. And it's all come together into this one big book. Now, we speak of the Bible later on and ask the question is the Bible contradictory? Are there contradictions within the Bible? And we'll see what we have to say, talk more about the transmission and the revelation and the um, translation of the Bible. <laughs> the Bible says to itself that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now that's the Bible. So as a Christian, when I think about Christianity, a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ, a relationship by faith in Jesus Christ, based upon what the Bible says about me, what the Bible says about God, what the Bible says about Christ, and his death, burial, and resurrection, and about everything else, when you look into that, you might say, well, that's all very interesting, and it might even be true. But it's not relevant to me. It's not relevant to me. 
That's what Einstein said. The facts, although interesting, are irrelevant. But that's a valid point. Because you can establish something that's factually correct, but yet no relevance to you as a person. And so it may well be that you think of the Christianity as something that may have uh, relevance and credibility, but just not of any relevance to yourself. Well, I want to suggest to you that that is not the case. And let's look a little bit further. So let's ask another question. If I'm saying that Christianity is credible because it's based upon the Bible, Christianity is credible because it's relevant, and this is a big word for today, relevance. Well, in what way is Christianity relevant? Well, when the philosophers speak about relevance, they generally speak about three things. They speak about meaning, morality, and hope. And these three words usually define relevance. Something or someone that has meaning, that has morality and hope. These three issues. Meaning, morality, and hope. Now I'm only going to deal with the first one. Morality and hope I'm not going to deal with them. But just to say this. When you learn what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, when you learn what it says about God, you will find this, that the Bible tells us about morality. It tells us about righteousness and unrighteousness. It tells us about God's character and God's standards and God's expectations of us. Morality. It doesn't speak about that as being subjective but objective and little change. Hope, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, Christianity is the source of genuine hope. Not speculative expectation, but absolute certainty in eternity. Now these are things that are important today. I'm not going to touch them, but we live in a world and in a country where people ask a lot of questions about subjects such as morality. It would be a conversation subject. People also seek hope. Hope is a big word in society today. The lack of it and what that leads to. The basis of it and the certainty of it. Hope. So let's come to this meaning. The meaning of life. Now, this is a big thing too, it's a very important thing to suggest, because when you think about life in a very kind of, well, brutal way, this is what life is, except sometimes we don't actually get to the end. This is right up to, and maybe some of you are struggling to remember some of this, but maybe you cannot remember all of it, and we write through, and then write this flag back there. And then the back starts to go, the stick comes in, go here, down you go, over and out. And that's kind of superficial, isn't it? That's actually what it is. Life is a journey from there to there. Now, none of us know how long that will be, and none of us know at what stage that will stop. For many, it could stop as soon as they are. For some, there is the full scope of life. But there's an uncertainty to it. Ask yourself the question what is the purpose of that? What is the meaning of that? What is that all about? Now, that is a question that perhaps, because it's such a big question, we Think about it then, don't think about it. Think, no, somebody else will not have to make an ask. I'm just going to go on with that. Normal life is hard enough to you know, pay you and the big things like that. But this is not just a philosophical image. This is you. And this is me. Where am I? Well, I'll probably be here at the moment. Where are you? The question of what is the meaning of Neil Tolstoy, the magnificent beard, was born in 1828, Russian, very famous author, and a bit of a philosopher as well. 
the date of 1910, but he says in the verse in that he was not a Christian, but he was an observer of the things that matter in life. And his comments are interesting. Now, he wrote this a confession. He went through a very depressing period in his life when he was questioning the meaning of life and writing about it. And in that, a confession wrote written in 1879, he wrote this, my question, what will come of what I am doing today? Or shall we do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? He's asking about the meaning of life. He says, differently expressed, the question is, why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed thus, is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? He's saying this, is there anything about my life that will mean something after I'm gone? And he was thinking about his life and the significance of it. And he was asking the question, when I live my life, is that it? And then death comes, is that it? Is that all there is to it? Now, a more modern commentator, again, an atheist, uh, Carl Sagan, very famous philosopher, he said this, the cosmos is within us. We're made of star stuff. That's the name of the ice or something, you know, star stuff. We're made of star stuff. We are away from the cosmos to know itself. I don't even know what that means. I'm not sure you know that. You know, that is, sounds to me a bit like Gothenburg. I don't understand even what is being said. But he said something a bit more understandable, I think, and it was this. The hard truth seems to be this. We live in a vast and awesome universe in which daily suns are made and worlds destroyed. For humanity clings to an obscure floor of rock. The significance of our lives in our fragile realm derives from our own wisdom and courage. We are the custodians of life's meaning. What he's saying is this, we determine what our lives mean. No one else. That's us. I am, it's invictus, isn't it? I am the master of my own destiny. We would prefer it to be otherwise, of course, but there is no compelling evidence for a cosmic parent who will care for us and save us from ourselves. It's up to us. Now, although that sounds again a bit harsh, but actually, if you're an atheist and don't believe in God or have a relationship with God, then actually, he's right. He's right. It's up to us. There's no one else. There's no cosmic parent, as he clearly does. If there is no God, then there is no one out with us. There is nothing out with us that will provide us with meaning and significance for what we are and what we do in life. Well, let's go down another bit. What do we mean by meaning? What do we mean by meaning? And in what way does the gospel of the Bible, in Christianity, what, in what way does that provide us with meaning? Well, three things. Purpose, significance, and value. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ and trust him as your saviour, the Bible tells us that you are brought into this. There is purpose for your life. There is significance for you in relation to God and eternity and value that goes beyond time. And what do we mean by that? Well, listen to this. Christians gain their meaning of life from outside of themselves, which is that we look to God, I look to God, and it is from God that I gain meaning for my life. In what way? Well, the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God. The Bible tells us of a living God, a God who created all things. The Bible tells us that evolution, that theory, is not how the world came into being, but rather that the living God created and created it well. God saw that it was good. A literal six day creation and a day of rest. And from that, we learn this that there was a relationship depicting that very famous painting, a relationship by that kind of strange depiction of God and that even stranger depiction of man, and a relationship which man yearns for, but which is broken. Broken by sin, the Bible says. 
broken by our rebellion against God, our turning away from God, our desire to go our own way, to, to find our meaning and significance and value and everything in life in ourselves and not from a God or not from the God and not from anyone outside of us. And the Westminster Catechism says this the man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Do you know, the reality is just this that when you become a Christian, the purpose of your life is Godward, essentially. It's lived accountable to God in relationship with God and anticipated being with God for all eternity. God becomes big in your life. And your life has purpose because of that relationship with God. Purpose beyond that. Significance. The Bible tells us that God places huge significance upon us. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And the creation story is that God created man and woman, put them into the world, populated the world, and gave man authority and significance within his creation. And he had a relationship with men, whereby men would glorify him, whereby men would serve them with their authority over creation, that sin came into the world and disturbed that. What about value? Well, the Bible tells us about the value God places on us. The value that we have in relation to God. God shows his love for us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible tells us that God loved us so much, valued us so much, that he sent his son into the world. That's the story of Jesus. This is Easter time. That's the story of him coming down. That's Good Friday. That's the cross. That's his death. And his resurrection, Easter Sunday. And the Bible speaks about his death and his resurrection is hugely significant because in his death and resurrection, the Lord Jesus paid the price for sin and made it possible for us to be reconciled to God because the big issue of sin was separating us from God, he dealt with in his cross. And the value that God places upon us is seen in the extent to which he would go in order to save us from our sin and to bring us into relationship with himself, to be with him for all eternity. God shows, he demonstrates his love for us. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you're not a Christian or a believer in God, then you cannot gain the meaning of your life from any other place than within yourself or within other people. That's it. Stanley Kubrick said this, and then he was a famous uh, writer amongst other things, and he said, since there's nothing outside us that can ascribe meaning to our lives, any meaning must come from within us, either as individuals or as a society. The very meaninglessness of life forces man to create his own meaning. So we have to come up with all sorts of things to provide meaning for our life. Legacy. Pseudo legacy. Men build statues. Main streets. Football stands. Foundations. Whatever. What, what is that all about? Legacy. Meaning. Significance. But they have to provide it. Or other people have to provide it for them. What I'm saying to you is this. That when you come to the Bible, you find this. That God provides significance and meaning for those who come to him through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's subjective and it's self Describe. Bertrand Russell wrote this that the universe, as he understood it, is purposeless and void of meaning. The entire sum of human endeavors is destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. What he said is just this the solar system is dying from within. The world is trying to say it's growing, it's expanding, and it's contracting. We don't even know. But what he said is, is just this, and it actually 
eight sins that we do not need to involve. Now, the entire sum of human endeavors is destined to extinction in the last ten years or so. Everything that takes place on this earth has no meaning beyond it. And in the vastness of the universe in which we inhabit, this earth is just a speck according to this. A speck according to this. That's not the perspective of the Bible. Dawkins uh, put it this way in his work. Demon. He says, the universe we observe is precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. He says, if there is no God, and he doesn't believe there is, then of course there is no morality. No such thing as good and evil. Because who determines what is good and what is evil? He says, no purpose. Because at the end, there's nothing beyond us. So there is no purpose beyond ourselves. That's Dawkins. He concludes that there's nothing but blind business. That's absolute hopelessness. When you come to the Bible, let's say again, it's a completely different story. It's the story of a God who created, who created by design and order. A story of a God who lives and who loves and who is deeply interested in every single one of us who are his creation. Who wants a relationship with us, not just for time, not just for significance in life, but for eternity. Beyond death. Down into the great eternity. Listen to what the Lord said, the Lord Jesus said when we see. This is found in John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, I came that they may have life and have abundance. The Lord Jesus came to give people abundant life. Not a miserable life. A life with meaning, with purpose, and with value, and with significance. A life that has significance for eternity. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says that Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous, that's him, and the unrighteous, that's us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. So, Christianity, and it's suggesting to you this. Christianity is credible, number one, because of the Bible. Number two, because of the relevance. It is based upon the Bible, that's the factual foundation. And it is relevant to every single one of us. It provides meaning, it speaks to morality, and it speaks to hope. Therefore, it is relevant to all of us. For we live in a world where morality and hope and meaning. This is Christianity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever, whoever, anyone, everyone who believes, who trusts in his faith, who looks at what God says in the Bible and is willing to believe God the truth, who believes in him, Jesus Christ, will not perish, but have a life life. That's the gospel. That's a snapshot of the gospel. The Bible is so much more to say. But I hope that what I've said, and that's been finished, I hope that what I've said has provoked at least some thought. And to think, if you'd like to come back in the end and speak more about the Bible, to think about the Absolute relevance of this message for every single one of us. Not to be solicit, not to think of it just as a kind of religious tradition or something like that, but as to think about it as a serious decision based on after you read up the evidence and the information of the Bible in relation to things that matter. Well, thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. Hope you will be listening to this slide, okay? I hope you were. 